All right, I'm going to talk a little bit or try to do something with Charles Sanders Purse's amazing paper. Truly an astonishing thing, I think, like a lot of purse. I don't know if that's pretty empty. I'll try to show you to some extent. Uh, some consequences of four incapacities. It's a classic paper. Uh, do I have a year on this? 1868. 1868. Okay. Um, now, Purse does a bunch of things in here, including kind of uh, airing a portion of his semiotics. Only a tiny portion. This was a fully worked out science. I think Peirce coined the term semiotics for the science of signs. Um, and I'm not going to really get into that part in a way. Uh, but here are some of the other things he does. With, with what degree of success, uh, you know, maybe you can judge for yourself. I don't know. It's, um, but with some success. He refutes modern philosophy. Now here I have my little list of uh, accomplishments. I put it on a whiteboard. But really, I have the real world out here instead. Um, he refutes modern philosophy. Starting with Cartesian skepticism. He denies the existence of mental imagery. This is uh, an interesting quasi-semi-popular position among some hard-ass analytic philosophers at the present time. Daniel Dennett was famous, has famously long been a skeptic of the of idea of mental imagery, that there are any such things at all. In normal vision, so there are no sense data on Peirce's view, or in imagination. Or in dreams, for example, he explicitly talks about that. Eighteen sixty-eight. Okay, and his reasons actually uh, connect to these to the contemporary arguments in various ways. I'm no expert on these contemporary arguments, so I'd have to remind myself on, on uh, their content. Keith Frankish, are you out there? Um, Okay, refutes modern philosophy, uh, denies the existence of, of imagery at all, and hence, for one thing, of sense data. Of course, you know, are, you know, what Hume calls ideas, or Descartes calls ideas, or Locke calls ideas, or Berkeley calls ideas. Sense data. Um... So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of what I mean when I say that he uh, uh, refused modern philosophy. Because, boy, oh boy, uh, the idea that we experience the world through our sense data, and kind of individually at that, uh, at least until you get to Hegel, you know, like as an individual consciousness, I'm looking at this kind of theater of sense data, or this theater of imagery. That's how I'm experiencing the world. Okay, that's really very central to modern philosophy. Uh, you know, and Peirce has about the most sophisticated refutation of that that had been put forward up to that time, anyway, uh, or has been put forward since, even, in some ways, which is not to say it's right, necessarily. Um, okay, uh, and he moves from that kind of modernist model of, uh, you know, having pictures running through your head to a kind of linguistic constructivism. I really think that the position of uh, my teacher, Richard Rorty, is anticipated vividly in the, his, his postmodern pragmatism, postmodern textualism, that's what Rorty called his own position. Uh, maybe we'll get a dose of that a little later in the semester. Um, not that there's that much left, but uh, uh, 
in a w- okay, so rather than a, experiencing a Cartesian theater of ideas construed as mental images, basically, um, with maybe analogous um, objects of consciousness with regard to the other senses. Um, uh, figures like Rorty in the 70s and 80s, I guess, you know, uh, talked about how we construct a world linguistically. And ourselves too, maybe. There's a lot of versions of this, kind of uh, narrativism, where, you know, our world or maybe, or ourselves are stories of a certain kind. Uh, that's a very unsophisticated way to take this kind of position. But, you know, a kind of postmodern textualism that might be associated with figures like Jacques Derrida. All right. In fact, there's a shitload of deconstruction uh, of various kinds in Peirce. His semiotics is a semiotics of difference. Everything, any sign only means in contrast to uh, what it fails to mean. It's, it carves out a space negatively, as it were, or it is a space carved out negatively in a system of signs. Saucer was doing that, I think, you know, 50 years later. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, and then Derrida, you know, makes a lot of that kind of move, deconstruction or whatever, all right? Um, so this is kind of an amazing thing, you know. Uh, now, again, it, but it's also very difficult going. Purse is not, often not a pleasure to read. And, uh, you know, you got to tease it out. He's got, like, very, very sharp moments. But then he's got very clotted uh, moments where you, you might read it over and over again and go, not go like, wow, oh, I'm not entirely certain what that, uh, that means. He's certainly trying to be clear. As this famous paper, How to Make Our Ideas Clear, would indicate that he finds that desirable. All right, so just a, f- a few little slices of some consequences of four incapacities. So this is how he dispenses with Descartes. And in a way, he does regard this, I think, uh, as many did, uh, or do even, as the foundation of modern philosophy, Cartesian skepticism, methodological doubt. I bet you've had this in one class or another. Uh, maybe? Anyway, um, he says this on the first page of Some Consequences of Four Incapacities, 228 of uh, Philosophical Writings of Purse. We cannot begin with complete doubt. We must begin with all the prejudices which we actually have when we enter upon the study of philosophy. Yeah, you're not going to be able to dump out all your prejudices. That's just impossible. As Hans George Gadamer, the uh, the dude of hermeneutics, uh, also argued. Kierkegaard argues this uh, against Descartes and his ilk. Something similar. These prejudices are not to be dispelled by a maxim. You know, doubt whatever is whatever you can't prove. Doubt whatever is not clear and distinct. He kills clear and distinct in here, man. And I'm not really going to do that, but man, you know, you recall what what those are marks of truth according to Descartes. Uh, he destroys that sort of approach. All right. Uh, anyway, Purse does. Okay. Um, These prejudices are not to be dispelled by a maxim, for they are things which it does not occur to us can be questioned. For instance, the subject predicate form of, uh, um, you know, a grammatical sentence in uh, some languages anyway. Uh, Hence, this initial skepticism will be a mere self-deception and not real doubt. Descartes never doubted shit. And, you know, you can tell because he ends up where he started, believing all the same things he started believing, by believing. Coincidence? Yeah, whatever, man. Uh, And he heaps up the prejudices, right? Like, uh, you know, it's not like he's 
go, Descartes is going somewhere with no assumptions. I could give an elaborate argument for that. Maybe I have here and there in books and stuff, but mostly quoting people like Peirce. Um, hence, this initial skepticism will be a mere self-deception and not real doubt. And no one who follows the Cartesian method will ever be satisfied until he has formally recovered all those beliefs which in form he has given up. That's the purpose in the beginning. Like, we're going to just, uh, uh, we're going to believe the same, but now we're going to claim that we believe it with a kind of certainty that we didn't before because we claim to have doubted it. Okay. But we didn't succeed in doing that. Methodological doubt is not doubt. Um, a person may, says Peirce, it is true, in the course of his studies, find reason to doubt what he began by believing. But in that case, he doubts because he has a positive reason for it, not on account of the Cartesian maxim. You know, doubt whatever can be doubted. Let us not pretend to doubt in philosophy what we do not doubt in our hearts. But, you know, don't just be a hit, you know, don't be a hypocrite, philosopher. Tell me what you really doubt. Not uh, so, and because one thing is for Peirce, if philosophy doesn't have some kind of pragmatic upshot, if it's not uh, helping us, okay, the, I mean, in a way, doubt is the human condition. And what inquiry is for, is for relieving our doubts practically, okay? making a difference in the world that makes us more secure or something like that. Do you see? Relieving doubtful or problematic situations is why we think at all, according to Peirce, why we have any beliefs. Okay? So uh, hyperbolic or, you know, um, hypothetical doubts, he's just, it's, this is just an application of pragmatism, you know? Like, uh, no, bring me a real doubt. We got plenty of, plenty of those. And I'll tell you one thing you've never doubted, like the existence of an external world. Right. Now, you know, like, and you could think about, and you probably have thought, you may have thought about this, like, uh, what pragmatic difference does it make if this is all ideas or if this is all physical stuff? And maybe Barclay explicitly argued that it doesn't make any di practical difference. So if you're purist, you just go like, well, then, you know, get rid of these books and stuff like that, right? Like, uh, come to me with a real problem, a real problem, and we'll try to solve it through inquiry. But don't, like, play these games. Okay. Um, now, you'll recall it for Descartes, and I, and I think that uh, Peirce thinks this is true of a lot of modern philosophy, he says as much. Uh the power of introspection and and hence a kind of individualism is under is underpins the whole project from Descartes to Kant okay I'm not saying you can't find a little exception in here or something you know uh, it's and and this couldn't be more explicit than Descartes right my access to my own ideas is privileged my knowledge of the world rests on my introspection. I think, therefore, I am. That's the foundation of my knowledge. How do I know that? Via introspection. Okay. And introspection yields a kind of certainty that extrospection or experience of the actual world doesn't because that could always just be false imagery or something. Supposing that there's imagery involved at all. So here's a radical proposition to face, to, to confront modern philosophy, a lot of it with Kant too, for example. We have, this is page 230, we have no power of introspection. Flat assertion, we have no power of introspection. But all knowledge of the internal world the alleged internal world, is derived by hypothetical reasoning from our knowledge of external facts. We infer our sense data 
from the actual stuff we're experiencing in the world. Like someone like Barkley does, or whatever, I guess, or uh, 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 Descartes or Hume, or Locke. Um, yeah, so we have no power of introspection. We're never engaged in a pure self-examination because our even connection to ourselves is through the external world which in turn is going to be thought of as a system of signs. But anyway, let's hold on to that for a second. Um, we have no power of intuition. But every cognition is determined logically by previous cognitions. There's a flow of consciousness and a flow of inference, not like an in intuitive grasp of a specific fact. And he's constantly emphasizing uh, the flow of consciousness. It's temporality, for one thing. Okay? Uh, you don't intuit the truth of some claim. It's part of a gigantic system of claims. And if you come to think it's true, it's because it fits in that system somewhere for you. Right? Or your system. Or our system. Okay, um, we have no power of thinking without signs. Signs conceived fundamentally linguistically. And we have no conception of the absolutely incognizable, which I'd like to read as, wherever we cannot speak, thereof we must be silent. Wittgenstein, more or less. Maybe. Okay, that's the start. Attacking Descartes. Uh, so he doesn't, you know, refute methodological skepticism or Cartesian doubt or something like that. He just says, like, it's not real. Okay? Like, I, I don't have to refute it. It's not actual. You never doubted a damn thing, Rene. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, now, let's discuss his claim that there are no mental images. That's quite, or I don't know anyone else who's quite doing this in 1868 or for a long time after that. Um, all right. Here's one chunk of it. I'm going to read it, I guess, and then try to interpret it. This is on page 242. Every possible character, or the negative thereof, must be true of an image. In the words of the most eminent expounder of the doctrine, I think that he's, this is Barclay, I should have tried to look this up. Uh, the image of a man, quote, must be either of a white or a black or a tawny man, a straight or a crooked man a tall or a low or a middle-sized man. A man must be a man with his mouth wide open or his mouth shut, whose hair is precisely of such and such a shade, and whose figure has precisely such and such proportions. No statement of Locke has been so scouted or attacked uh, by all the friend, friends of images, the friends of images, that's who he's attacking, uh, friends of mental images, as his denial that the idea of a triangle must, that Locke's denial that the idea of a triangle must be either of an obtuse, obtuse angled, right angled, or acute angled triangle. Like, did you have an idea of a triangle? It, to have a mental image of a triangle, it's got to be of a, uh, Barclay claims. For example, it's going to be absolutely specific triangle. It's got to be either a right angle triangle or a uh, obtuse angle triangle. Um, there are no vague mental images. That's the claim. Whereas Locke's claim is that you do have a vague mental image of a triangle that encompasses all the possible triangles, which really is puzzling. Okay, so an image, uh, you know, actually Peirce argues that an image must be fully determinate. 
And to account for our experience, our visual experience at a moment, it must be so replete as to be infinite, actually. Like the visual experience I'm having right now is infinitely variegated and infinitely complex and infinitely relational of things among other things and so on. All right. But no, I'm not, my mental capacity is not capable of producing such a thing. All right. Um, this being so, it is apparent that no man has a true image. No man has a true image of the road to his office or of any other real thing. Indeed, he has no image of it at all unless he can not only recognize it, but imagines it truly and falsely in all its infinite details. All right, so for example, do you have an image of the road to your office, you know, or the road to somewhere that familiar? An image in your head that would distinguish it fully from other similar uh, roads to wherever. Well, how much content do you really have? He's asking at that moment. Or how much content are you convincing yourself you have, sort of? Um, this being the case, it becomes very doubtful whether we ever have any such thing as an image in our imagination. Now, here is a really sophisticated argument rolling right here, right about here. Please, reader, look at a bright red book or other brightly colored object and then shut your eyes and say whether you see that color, whether brightly or faintly, whether indeed there's anything like sight there. Hume and other followers of Barclay <laughs> maintain that there is no difference between the sight and the memory of the red book, except, quote, in their different degrees of force and vivacity. Hume argues that the difference between seeing a red book and remembering seeing a red book is simply the force and vivacity of the image. Because there's an image in both cases. When you see a red book, you're producing a sense datum, a idea. Um, and uh, and uh, okay, and um, and then when you remember it, you're having the same idea, or you know, a, a similar idea, but it's less vivid. That's what's different about memory. That's the only thing that's different about a, a remembered and a presently experienced sense datum for Hume. Um, the, okay, the colors which the memory employs, says Hume, quote, this is, these are quotes, are faint and dull compared with those in which our original perceptions are clothed. If this were a correct statement of the difference, we should remember the book as being less red than it is. Whereas, in fact, we remember the color with very great precision for a few moments. Please test this point, reader. Although we do not see anything like it, we carry away absolutely nothing of the color except the consciousness that we could recognize it. We see, we sort of, uh, uh, we may take ourselves to be having mental imagery, or we may not, but uh, what we're really doing is drawing an inference. It's expressing our confidence that we could re-recognize that color in the real world. That's what we mean when we say we remember it. It's an ability to do something in the future, not a correct momentary representation of a particular object at a particular moment. Right? This is an incredibly sophisticated uh, and interesting and radical argument. Um, and, okay, so check this out on uh, the bottom of 243. It's important to remember that we have no intuitive power, intuitive power, of distinguishing between one subjective mode of cognition and another. We have no intuitive power of distinguishing between one subjective mode of cognition and another. So Descartes is relying on this idea of the transparency of our consciousness to ourselves. And Peirce is just flatly denying it. 
Okay, and so one thing he's saying is we take ourselves to be having mental images, but that doesn't entail that we are actually having mental images. Because we're not that reliable, maybe, in distinguishing one mode of cognition, like inference and description, uh, uh, from another, having images. And hence, we often think that something is presented to us as a picture, while it is really constructed from slight data by the understanding. We often think that something is a picture, but it's just because on the slightest of data, we actually, when, when you get right down to it, we couldn't form a picture of it at all. Certainly not a fully determinate picture, which is what he's demanding here following Barclay. Um, this is the case with dreams. As is shown by the frequent impossibility of giving an intelligible account of one without adding something which we feel was not in the dream itself. Many dreams, of which the waking memory makes elaborate and consistent stories, the waking memory infers it out into a series of stories, and again, it's basically narrative and linguistic, uh, you know, rather than iconic uh, or pictorial. Um, must probably have, in fact, been mere jumbles. These dreams must, in fact which we t interpret as stories. And this is became a theory of dreaming in the last 20, 30 years, right? In, in, among psychologists. Must probably, in fact, been mere jumbles of those feelings of the ability to recognize this and that, which I've just alluded to. Like, okay, so when we interpret our own dreams, we reorder them into these, first of all, imagery, and second of all, co some sort of quasi-coherent narrative. But we're unreliable in reporting our own uh, mental states, man. That's one thing, one problem. And another problem is that this whole account is totally unexplanatory of anything, including especially perception. I will now go so far as to say that we have no images even in actual perception. It will be sufficient to prove this in the case of vision. Uh, for if no picture is seen when we look at an object, no picture is seen when we look at an object, it will not be claimed that hearing, touch, and the other senses are superior to sight in this respect, that they produce pictures, though sight does not, for example. That the picture is not painted on the nerves of the retina is absolutely certain. If, as physiologists inform us, these nerves are needle points pointing to the light and at distances considerably greater than the minimum visible. All right, maybe I won't rehearse that argument, but it's, uh, so this idea of images painted on the retina or whatever. Okay, but then what is the system that, that uh, processes those images? Uh, because it doesn't have the kind of repleteness that an image has in our, uh, you know, claimed experience. Um, thus, to suppose that we have an image before us when we see is not only a hypothesis which explains nothing whatever, but is one which actually creates difficulties which require new hypotheses in order to explain them away. All right? <laughs> okay. Um, I'll try to bring this around. Um, now, the move to language and inference and so on is also a move into the social. He's, he, his denial of modern philosophy is rests in large, to a large extent on his denial of individualism in epistemology, in how we know, in experience, in, you know, uh, because it rests on language and language is a public entity for Peirce no less than for Wittgenstein, for example. A private language is impossible for purse no less than Wittgenstein. Um, okay, I don't mean, know if that necessarily means anything to you. Um, what we what do we mean by the real? And now you recall these passages from How to Make Our Ideas Clear About the Real. 
It is a conception which we must first have had when we discovered that there was an unreal, an illusion. That is when we first corrected ourselves. That's where the concept of real comes from. This is kind of an example of this uh, deconstructive style move. Uh, it's sort of Hegelian move too, we might say. You know, like uh, the real, the moment we found something real was the moment we experienced an illusion or took ourselves to experience an illusion. Now, the distinction for which alone this fact logically called was between an ends relative to private inward determinations, to the negotiations belonging to idiosyncrasy, and an ends which such as would stand in the long run. And that is a, con uh, a contrast between the individual and the community. How did I know I was having an illusion? Because the people around me didn't experience it the same way, or said they didn't. As we communicated in a social in language, which is a network of signs, that is, a network of social conventions. Um, the real is that which, sooner or later, information and reasoning would finally result in as an opinion, and which is therefore independent of the vagaries of you and me, independent of our individuality. Thus, the very origin of the conception of reality shows that this conception essentially involves the notion of community. In 1868, man, this is, uh, sounds like philosophy from 150 years later, without definite limits and capable of definite increase of knowledge. Okay. And so these two series of cognitions, the real and the unreal, consist of those which, at a time sufficiently future, the convergence, again, of opinions in the long run, of rational inquirers, the community will always continue to reaffirm. Um, and of those under such conditions, which will be denied. Okay, so truth and reality are social facts articulated through the social convention of language. That's the the position of Rorty. Maybe it's the position of Derrida, for example. It's the position Rorty attributed to Derrida. Maybe it's the position of Wittgenstein. Mm-hmm. Quite close in many ways. Um, okay. The last, the coup de grace. He says we are signs. Okay. Uh, that's that goes beyond even Rorty. Now, maybe this is sort of Derrida or something like this. Um, and, you know, it takes him a while to get here. I still don't think he does quite get here argumentatively, but this is a wild declaration. Um, it is sufficient to say that there is no, this is on page 249. It is sufficient to say that there is no element whatever of man's consciousness which has not something corresponding to it in the word, in the word. No element of man's consciousness which is not uh, bound up with language. And the reason is obvious. It is that the word or sign which man uses is the man himself. The word or sign which a man uses is the man himself. Ooh. Okay, try working on that for a while. One thing he does argue and say in various places is that we are to ourselves signs. When Descartes says I, he's experiencing himself qua sign. Four, uh, as the fact that every thought is a sign, as a sign, taken in conjunction with the fact that life is a train of thought, is it though? Proves that man is a sign. So that every thought is an external sign. So, so, that every thought is an external sign. He's an externalist of a certain kind. Content is not in my head. Proves that man is an external sign. That is to say, the man and the external sign are identical, in the same sense in which the words homo and man are identical. Thus, my language is the sum total of myself. 
My language is the sum total of myself, and that presupposes a community. I, I, yeah, people came to say stuff like this in the 1980s. And again, I'm not saying that makes it true, boy. I'm not even quite sure how he got there or what the frig it means uh, that I am a sign. But he's running some deep shit, man. In 1868. Okay, I know I keep saying that. I find this impressive. Next week, William James.